and ice, this exhibit, is a perfect emblematic idea of the artist telling a story of what's going on in the world through the artist's eyes. Rather than just using words, we see visuals, we see videos, we hear music. So this is a perfect marriage for Asia Society to bring to the Kennedy Center because we are a place for culture, art, debate, discussion, review, and to do so with this extraordinary exhibit is a true blessing. This uh, exhibit marks the East Coast premiere of the exhibit. It's been around the world. My colleagues here will tell you more about that shortly. It comes to us, as any good project would, through the suggestion from an artist. I was in a conversation with my longtime good friend, Michael Tilson Thomas, the former conductor of the San Francisco Symphony, the conductor, artistic director laureate of the New World Symphony, and he told me about this exhibit that had been in San Francisco. We were talking about a residency for, here, for him here at the Kennedy Center, and he said, absolutely, we need to have coal and ice be a piece of that. So I say thank you to Robert Van Leer, our Senior Vice President of Artistic Planning, who initiated this, and then to Alicia Adams and Gilda Almeida from our programming department, who are our internal experts on exhibits for making sure that this could happen. It is particularly poignant for us in this, our 50th anniversary season of the Kennedy Center, to be hosting this, because this exhibit is a reflection on what has happened and looking backward, but also an opportunity for us to look forward, to understand the role of artists and we as citizens in our world as to what we can do to help our world. Asia Society has been an extraordinary partner. It is um, not impossible to say it would not be here without them. They are the creators, they are the proponents, they are the, the designers of this exhibit. We are just the home, and we are very, very happy to be the home for this exhibit for the coming weeks. So welcome. You are the first to be in these spaces. I'm seeing it for the first time today as well. And we're just absolutely thrilled to be hosting this here at the Kennedy Center. I'd now like to introduce you to the president of the Asia Society, uh, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here at uh, the Kennedy Centre. Uh, I've long admired this place. I've been to many of its concerts. And a very happy 50th birthday to this uh, marvellous American institution where so much good is done in this city, across the country, and in the world. We at the Asia Society um, celebrate our 65th anniversary this year. And what I think brings our institutions together with this marvellous uh, exhibition on coal and ice, this living exhibition on coal and ice, is our common dedication to the world of arts and culture and the world of public policy. Um, and how do we bring these two worlds together in order to enliven the world's response to this existential challenge for us all called climate change? Today, according to my calendar at least, though I've just flown in from the land down under, uh, is the 15th of March, which makes it the Ides of March. So I can say on behalf of the planet, beware the Ides of March. Uh, because uh, what you see before you in this extraordinary exhibition put together by my friend and colleague Orville Schell and his colleagues uh, in the Asia Society is a living expression of what happens with the mining of coal to sustain people's livings and to provide warmth and energy through to its impact on the glaciers of the Himalayas and glaciers the world over, through to the river systems of the world, through to the extremity of weather events around the world through to the impact on the biosphere, including ourselves as human beings, through to what can be done about it by way of renewable energy alternatives. 
And so what we seek to do in this exhibition is to bring the narrative of each together into a story which makes sense for us all. And that's what Coal Plus Ice is all about. Orville uh, Shell has um, put this together first and most originally uh, in China itself. What you see by way of the uh, extraordinary photography uh, of the uh, Himalayas is um, done by his team a decade or more ago. What is interesting about the journey of this exhibition, Coal and Ice, uh, is it has also tracked and mapped the journey on climate change of China itself. All the knife for our sins are what we call in the trade sinologists. Uh, that is, we were useless for anything else in life other than the professional study of China. Um, so we've studied our Chinese language, we've studied our Chinese history, and together, Orville, we've spent I don't know how much time in the country over the years in one capacity or another. But for those of us who study the country carefully, we understand full well that China's own national consciousness on climate has come quite recently. And it came because the, of the impact of coal on the lungs of Chinese workers. It came through the impact of tailings dams uh, on the purity of China's water supply, which in turn impacted the quality of its agriculture and the safety of its food. And eventually, the particulate matter pollution in the atmosphere across China's major cities. And the result of all that over the span of a decade was that even in communist China, a one-party state with an authoritarian political culture, the communist party got the message finally that something needed to be done. And through the agency of President Obama uh, and his engagement with President Xi Jinping in the lead up to the Paris Agreement on Climate in 2015, finally changing Chinese consciousness and finally changing uh, political consciousness in this country came together and formed the Paris Agreement. But bringing together through the, the American and the Chinese national conversations, the thematics represented in the moving images and the still images which form part of this extraordinary exhibition. It may seem curious that we are launching this here in Washington DC as an existential challenge for us all, that is sustaining the planet itself, at a time when all of our minds are focused on the ancient crudities of geopolitics, Russia's heartless and brutal invasion of the Ukraine, and also, parallel to that, an important debate about China's support or otherwise uh, for Vladimir Putin's actions in Ukraine. Geopolitics, classical geopolitics, has come roaring back onto the global stage. But you know something in our national political lives, whether it's in the United States or China or my own country, Australia, guess what? We have to walk and chew gum at the same time, deal with geopolitics, deal with the challenge to uh, the inviability of national borders which have been fundamentally violated in the invasion of Ukraine, and at the same time, wrestle with this pan-civilizational challenge called climate change. We don't get a choice anymore of we'll focus on this and we'll ignore that. Uh, the world doesn't tolerate that. And last time I looked, uh, the planet uh, itself uh, doesn't necessarily accord to the political calendar of the year. It has its own rhythm rhythms which have been violated by human impact on it. And so despite what is unfolding in Ukraine, despite the debates which dominate the Congress uh, and uh, the parliaments and assemblies of the world this day, legitimately uh, on Ukraine and the future of the global order, this too is part of what needs to be done through that fractured global order which is why we're here at the Kennedy Center today. As I introduce my colleague, uh, Orville Schell, um, 
could I also make one reflection uh, for our friends back in Australia? You see, climate is global and climate is local. And it's also intergenerational. I once, when Prime Minister of Australia, was well and truly ridiculed for arguing the proposition that climate change represents the greatest moral challenge of our generation. I said that more than a decade ago. I mean it today and I make no apology for what I said back then. And the reason is this, our failure to act becomes a matter of intergenerational justice for what we morally then conclude can safely be bequeathed to the generation which follows us. Back home in my country, Australia, a group of young kids have taken the Australian government to court on what our laws describe as a duty of care to the next generation, on critical environmental decisions which impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Anjali, Isolde, Ambrose, Thomas, Bella, Laura, Ava, Luca. These are kids of 15, 16, 17 and 18 who, um, organised by a, an octogen octogenarian nun from the local Brigidine convent, have taken a case to the Federal Court of Australia to halt a particular action in a particular development which would have negative environmental consequences for the climate. They won their first round of the court case and yesterday uh, they lost the second round. So those kids are feeling despondent today. So in my own uh, way, I'd like to dedicate this opening today to them and the courage of the kids of the world as they take up action, uh, take up the challenge which many of my generation have left slide to one side and we honour their contribution to the cause. Orville Schell, um, in the world of uh, the Asia Society, the world of American journalism, a regular writer in the New York Review of Books, the New York Times, the Washington Post, you name it, Orville's written at it, uh, lectured in uh, journalism at Berkeley, uh, a supreme raconteur, formidable sinologist, author of much on contemporary Chinese politics, but also now through this, a passionate believer in the global challenge of climate change most particularly as it affects the dominant economic player in the 21st century, which will be the continent of Asia. Orville Schell, over to you. Well, thanks, Deborah, and thanks, Kevin, and to the Kennedy uh, Center staff and to my own team, wonderful. Somehow you got this thing up. And, uh, all the photographers are curators who you will meet shortly. Um, I just have a few very short thoughts. I think Kevin said it well. You know, it doesn't matter if, we're, if there is an invasion, if there's a pandemic, if the capital is being um, uh, overturned by uh, rebels in America, climate change goes on. And the nice thing about the Asia Society, from my view, is that while we are a think tank, we are also able to do everything else. Art, performance, music, dance, business, environment. And that is why we can be here today. Um, just very quickly, uh, let me tell you how all this, this very strange uh, production began. Um, you see this screen. Uh, my friend David Brashears, who you'll meet in a minute, a photographer somewhere out in the dark here, uh, he and I were making two frontline films in, on Tibet. And David has been up Mount Everest five times. And he started to say, you know, the glaciers have changed. And then he did something quite amazing. He got the photographs that were uh, taken by George Mallory in 1921 at Everest, went back to exactly the place where... Um, Mallory took them, and you'll see them here in a minute, and he retook them, and you just see the glacier drop. And then my dear friend Susan Mycelis, magnum photographer, she and I got together and started thinking, let's document coal in China, the largest emitter of carbon from coal. So we went off to China on several trips, it's another long story, and then all this somehow came together. And that's how 
coal plus ice was born. And we thought, all right, let's take people on an odyssey of what happens and to create the effects you see in there. Let's put a stage right in the middle of it and let's try to pull people into the show, sort of like a carnival barker with a good, good uh, you know, some, something inside. And that was our conceit. So now, um, let's turn to a few uh, questions from you all to uh, Deborah and Kevin, and then I want you to meet our curator, Jeroen de Vries, uh, and designer, and our curator, Susan Mycelis, and the photographers who are here who put this thing together, at least some of them. So if you all have any questions, um, now would be the time to pose them. Any questions? I'm stunned by your muteness. Yes. Hey, so my name is Eric. I was curious a little bit kind of why this is here now. And like you say, it's, uh, this is its debut on the East Coast. Why now and, and why here in DC? Well, uh, Deborah, you, you, you touched on that, but tell yeah. us more. Um, Michael Tilson Thomas was the first to bring it to me, and he will actually be in residence the next couple of weeks. And it is bookended by important days, and we felt like this was a, a good time for us to do it. We at the center believe that artists and reflections of artists actually amplify and tell a different story. And so this space is actually a great space for that conversation. Let me just embroider a trifle on that. When Michael, who's a very good friend of mine, um, was conducting Appalachian Spring in the San Francisco Symphony, and he said, let's team up. He was aware of this, thing, this show. So we hung some of the pictures over the orchestra, and we had a wonderful uh, singer who plays a five-string banjo. She sang a cappella to sing a coal mining song from Appalachia just before Appalachian Spring. And then we did myriad other things with Michael, and that's how, uh, uh, with Robert Van Leer, uh, he said, let's try to get this thing confected together uh, in Washington. And he will be here uh, on the 25th next week to, to conduct and um, uh, for two weeks running, so I urge you all to come. Uh, other questions? Yes, and then here. All right, here first. Hi there, my name is Lily Pike. I'm with Grid News. I'm a China reporter. Um, my question is, how has the exhibition been received you know, in China and elsewhere? What have the reactions been like in China versus other countries as the exhibition has toured around? <laughs> well, uh, it's never been easy to do anything in China. Uh, we went and we had Yo-Yo Ma, Meryl Streep, Jonathan Spence, one of the Cohen brothers, Alice Waters, and we did this magnificent show in the National Theater, and they wouldn't let us sell tickets. Uh, we had to only buy invitation only. So that was difficult back in the easy days. Now I would say you shouldn't even bother trying. I hope that will change, because if you don't have China in the game on climate change, you don't have a game. That's, as Kevin said, the bitter reality of it. Uh, yes. Um, David Smith of The Guardian. I, I think um, journalists and scientists and others have a difficulty with the climate message of uh, spelling out how serious it is, but while still maintaining some hope that uh, all is not lost and something can still be done. And I wonder, did you have a similar balancing act with this exhibition? And do, do you feel there's, there's, there are things here which make people feel, I'm not going to despair, but you know, that it, it's not too late to, to salvage this? Well, when it comes to hope, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kevin. Yeah, it's a really good question, because uh, I read out the names before of eight kids in Australia who are in the vortex of this. Hope uh, versus uh, current realities. But as someone who's been active in the global climate change debate and public policy action uh, for the last 15 years, let me give you a few things to be encouraged by. One is when we began this odyssey, uh, frankly, back with uh, 
what's called the Rio Conference on Sustainability back in 1992, no one knew what the hell we were talking about. Um, that's 30 years ago. By the time we got to the Copenhagen Conference in 2009, the possibility of getting China and the United States and India on the same page was like travelling between Mars and Venus. I was in the negotiating room with President Obama, the Chinese President, the Indians and others, Angela Merkel. Let me tell you, this was mission impossible. Roll the clock ahead another six years to Paris through the agency of President Obama, who I think learnt a lot from his Copenhagen experience, uh, and the changes in China itself, partly documented by what you see here. Suddenly you had them on the same page. And even by the time you get to the relative disappointment of Glasgow last year in the conference of the parties, what you see still is a global consensus emerging for the first time about car global carbon neutrality by 2050 and the, with uh, later commitments by China 2060, India 2070. Still too late for the planet. But my point to you is this. These folks, these governments, these countries are slowly rolling out their wagons in a direction which was inconceivable 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago. And I believe it will get faster. Final point is, one of the reasons, apart from the objective climatic evidence uh, that we see before us, of the type that we've just seen with the most recent International Panel of Climate Change Scientists report released only two weeks ago, one of the reasons, apart from the objective science which the political class ultimately have to respond to, is the kids of the world whose names I read out before. Those kids are all now voters in their respective countries. Not in China, they don't get to vote. They do get to vote in India, which is interesting. And there is a palpable move across the democratic world on the part of young folk who will be inheriting this planet for the duration of the century that the time for action was yesterday. And that is compelling an otherwise compromised political class today to do things that they feel un politically uncomfortable in doing. So as Bismarck once said of the business of global politics and of national politics, it's like making a German sausage, never a process to be observed too closely. Um, so it is with international political action on climate and national action. It's a very untidy process. But the arc of history is bending towards planetary justice on this one. The question mark is, will we be a decade late or half a decade early in order to avoid temperature increases by century's end of 3.5 degrees centigrade, which frankly, uh, are existential in their consequences for the planet. Well, thanks, Kevin. Let's get to the heart of the matter, the people who did these pho photographs and put it together. So Susan, Yaroon, why don't you come up and, and just, t just so people can say a few words and um, then people can know who you are and we can get to questions in one-on-one -on -one, and then you will introduce the photographers. So. Where's our through? team of photographers? Come yeah. so that people will find you in the exhibition. This is, I just want to say, there are six photographers of the 52. Sorry if you can hear me better. Um, six photographers of the 52. I want to give you a quick overview. We're looking at photographs from 1899 to 2021, more than a century. We're looking at work that's highly authored, that's independently created, that has been done by very dedicated documentarians, and I think what I'd like to do is just, since we have a short time, point to the places you all will find them to ask them the questions that you might have about their work. So, uh, well, we're in different, I was going to point first, where's Daniel? On the other side, the polar ice. Daniel Beltra, where are you? David, Brashears, behind us looking at, there he is, as he said, and had brought the glass plate. So we, we, brought, we go from technology 
glass plates all the way to anonymous iPhone images, which Yeroon has magnificently brought into this and some other. Does so we have anonymous and highly authored work. We have Gideon Mendel, whose work is The Drowning World, over 15 years of work traveling internationally. Jamie Stillings, who I always say is the future, He's at the very end. I think you really will be inspired by seeing what he's brought to us. Again, international landscape, the big initiatives, the big dreams we all have to transform to renewable energy. And who did I miss? Where's Cameron? There you are, sorry. So Cameron Davidson, who working in his hometown, essentially his home region in West Virginia, just behind you there, the strip mining from West Virginia. And did Darcy? Darcy, sorry, I didn't mean. So Darcy Padilla, also working Northern California, her own territory, documenting fires at, as recently as last year. So again, Yeroon, I give you a moment. We've been working for 15 years collaborating in this evolution of an installation, an immersive environment to invite you all and of course the public to reflect, to feel again the things that we have been in denial of, but it accumulates. Do you want to add? Yeah, I will be very short. Uh, I think Susan and I have tried to create an, an exhibition where the photography is not the, an illustration of a story, but where the photography tells the story. And I also think and I hope that the exhibition speaks for itself. So this is actually all I wanted to add. And, and we're going to be here, I think some of you, you may have questions for the photographers. They're in, they are identified with their paper, <laughs> paper flowers, symbolically, but we'll go back out into the areas where their own work is, but you're free to roam. This is a self-navigation experience. I hope you'll enter the cubicles and feel the sound and wander as you're comfortable. Thank you.